Let's, uh, let's get this started then. <clears throat> Can everybody hear me okay? Awesome. All right, well, how's it going everybody? Good afternoon. Uh, I don't know where my screen, there we go. Uh, so my name is John Biondi. I am a uh, network security software engineer at Double Verify. Uh, and today uh, I am pleased to, pr to present to you guys uh, my presentation on PubSub with Postgres. Uh, so, um, what I'm going to take you guys through today is, uh, you know, first off, what is PubSub, the theory behind it, uh, you know, just what am I talking about, um, <clears throat> then we'll talk about what this has to do with Postgres, uh, you know, how, how Postgres can help you with this, and then I'm going to walk you through like a sample application, so something, uh, a little experiment that I've, I've, I've uh, you know, used this for. So here we go, the description. So what is PubSub? PubSub is, uh, well, first, it's, it's short for uh, publish subscribe, which is a messaging pattern. Uh, so basically, it describes a way for two processes or two servers or you know, threads or whatever to, to communicate with each other. Uh, so it's a form of asynchronous communication. Um, it's basically, it's very, very similar to how a message queue works. In fact, it's usually bundled in as a package deal with uh, most of the big name message queues. So uh, like RabbitMQ. Uh, RabbitMQ uh, provides this functionality. Uh, so we have, it's basically a, you know, a, a two agent service or a two agent pattern. So you have a publisher which uh, generates messages. So it generates like events and it sends them off to some queue. And then we have subscribers that are then notified of relevant messages. Uh, so the messages are like, you know, popped out of the queue and sent to whoever was listening. Uh, so the best, you know, the, the reason we do this is because uh, it decouples publishers from subscribers. So it's not like, uh, like a REST endpoint or something where you have to keep polling. It's whenever the data is available, if you care, uh, you'll be notified. Uh, so decoupled, what, is, what does that mean? Uh, actually, it's like it's a loose, loose coupling. Uh, so publishers and subscribers don't communicate with each other. They don't necessarily know about each other. They don't really care about each other. Uh, all they care about is the data being sent between them. <clears throat> so a publisher will generate a message on a channel. So for uh, you know, for example, um, I want to know if uh, oh, when like a new user is generated, and that's all I care about. So the publisher will generate a message saying, you know, new user John created. Uh, it enters the queue and then anyone who cares, any subsystem or process that cares about uh, new users will then be, um, will then be notified about, about the, the new information. Uh, it's not like a fan out thing where, where all subscribers are, are um, told about all information. They, a subscriber, subscribes to a channel, so that could be any one or more um, channels, uh, which is like a topic or, or, or some, some form of information that they care about, and uh, that's all they get. So a publisher can be publishing you know, on hundreds of channels, hundreds of different kinds of information, and a sub subscriber will only get the subset that they care about. So this is how it looks with pretty colors. So here you see publishers broadcasting different kinds of information. It enters these queues, uh, and then a subscriber who is uh, subscribed to each you know, individual um, queue will then be notified. So how does Postgres do this? Postgres actually implements something similar. It implements this right out of the box, and that was my expression when I found that out. Um, the thing with Postgres, though, is it doesn't really, uh, it's a little bit different because the, the in a true PubSub implementation, the, like the message queue is almost like a third-party service. So you know, you'd have like one server talking to RabbitMQ, which then another server consumes. Uh, in Postgres, Postgres is both the publisher and the, the queuing service. So Postgres supplies this with uh, two functions, no, uh, listen and notify. So notify is the publishing. It looks like this. So you, you say notify the channel name, so like notify users, uh, and then you can supply a payload. So you'd say either notify users, which just broadcasts an event, 
uh, or you'd say you broadcast users and the payload, so it could be a user ID or a username or something like that. Um, and then Postgres applies a second function called pgnotify, which is a little bit more programmatic. So with pgnotify, it accepts uh, two, um, two text parameters, uh, which then you, know, you can do stuff like, like string concatenation and stuff in there to get something a little bit more dynamic. Uh, so notify as defined by the Postgres, the very detailed Postgres documentation, uh, is an inter-process communication mechanism um, for all these different processes that are accessing the same database. Um, the channels that Postgres can publish to, they're assigned by the programmer. So there's not like a really a standard or, or anything uh, that assigns them, you pick it. The common practice, though, is that usually um, you, you name the channel after like the table that you're, uh, you know, containing the information that you care about, but you can name it whatever you want. So when notify is called, uh, it generates an event. Uh, so an event looks like, it's basically just a string with a channel name, uh, the publisher server's PID, and then the payload string, which if you didn't supply one, is just the empty string. Um, so <clears throat> notifies are, uh, so you run a notify, you can run a notify inside a trigger or a transaction. Uh, you can run as many as you want. Like you can call this function as many times as you want inside a transaction, but they won't actually run until the, the trigger of the transaction is, has been committed. Uh, and I guess that makes sense because you know, if you have a transaction that rolls back, you don't want it to start putting out events because you, you can't take them back once they're gone or once they've been sent out. Um, so if you do multiple transactions in, or uh, multiple notifies in a single transaction, uh, Postgres is actually pretty smart about it. So if it sees that you're doing, you're notifying to the same channel with the same payload, uh, however many times in a single transaction, it can roll them as it can intelligently roll them into one, so it'll just be one notification. Um, but if they have different uh, payloads, <clears throat> um, then they, they're guaranteed to each, uh, each notification is guaranteed to be sent. And Postgres guarantees order of messages. So the order that they're generated within a transaction and then the order in which the transactions run uh, is the ordering. Uh, and then here's what it looks like in uh, the, uh, the console. So I subscribe to Listen, which we'll get to in a second. Get excited. Uh, so then I, I call Notify, uh, which just broadcasts a, 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 you know, an event with no payload. And you can see that Postgres has uh, received the notification. Uh, then the second one I do, I notify to the same channel again. Um, but this time with a payload. You can see that this is the payload and you can see that it has been uh, received. Then the second uh, little block on the bottom there shows PG Notify and how that works. So you can see the first, uh, you know, I, I call PG Notify with um, concatenation of FO and O to make foo, and the payload of pay concatenated with load to make payload. Uh, and then you can see the, the, the output of, of Postgres there where it received the notification. <clears throat> So the flip side of notify is listen. So listen is the subscriber part of this pattern. Um, so listen registers a uh, Postgres session as a listener on a channel. And you can call listen over and over and over and over and over again from the same channel or from the same session on the same channel. And Postgres will only register it once. So every time, every subsequent call will just do nothing. Um, I'm sorry, I get so excited about this, my mind just blanked. Uh, so, so similar to how the notifies don't run, uh, a notify won't actually happen until the notifying transaction is complete. The listener won't actually consume the event, uh, the notification that it's received until it's done with its transaction. So if it's in the middle of something, um, the message just sits in a queue waiting for it to, waiting for the listener to be ready to consume it, uh, which can cause some problems, which we'll get to in a second. Uh, whenever you're done listening or you don't care about, um, you, whenever you want to unsubscribe, 
you unregister with lit with unlisten. Uh, all registrations are automatically cleaned up when a session ends. So when you disconnect, either by accident or on purpose, uh, you're removed from, uh, from the subscriber list. Um, and a session can both listen and notify on the same channel, as we saw in my little demo code there, where I'm doing listen and notify at the same time. Uh, there it is again. <clears throat> so uh, a few seconds ago, I just I mentioned that um, there's that queue that messages go into when uh, they haven't been consumed. So Postgres puts all of the messages um, that haven't yet like fully been delivered but have been sent. Uh, it puts them in a message queue where they sit until all of the subscribers have been uh, had a chance to consume them or they've been delivered. This queue uh, by default is eight gigabits in, or eight gigabytes in size. <clears throat> um, so, like I said, if a listener enters a transaction, uh, the message sits in that queue, and if you have a really long-running transaction or a transaction that just doesn't end, Postgres can't clean out those messages. Um, so that could be a problem if you have like really high traffic and that message queue starts to fill up. At 50% capacity, it starts throwing warnings into the log with the PID of the offending listener. So it gives you the opportunity to, turn around, uh, to go in and kill that transaction to allow Postgres to start cleaning up. Um, and it's really important to pay attention to those logs because when it fills up, uh, notify, the notifies will fail and nobody will be notified anymore. <clears throat> so like possible applications of this, um, you know, you could have something like I mentioned before, like new users. So as a, every time a new user is, uh, a new row is created in like a user's table, a trigger can run, which, uh, you know, launches off a notification that some uh, client side app, some, app, some other application can consume that and then, you know, uh, spin off a welcome email or something uh, that is super useful. Uh, something a little bit more fun that I've been playing with, which we're, we're going to touch upon, is uh, cache management. So you can use it to, you know, uh, an event to trigger an invalidate cache or update cache or something like that. So now we'll get into some code. I don't know who's feeling who. I'm feeling like the guy on the right, and maybe you're on the, all the guy on the left. <clears throat> Uh, so I'm going to explain my, the problem a little bit. So I was uh, working on a, we were working on a data store that used Postgres as the storage backend. Uh, so the data store um, basically contained a log table. Uh, it was supposed to be like a generic object store, kind of like, a, I don't want to say the bad word of Mongo, but uh, it's it kind of like where it'll accept like any kind of data and be able to, you know, restructure it when you, when you need it. Um, so, uh, so we ended up storing everything in like this normalized log table, but then we had to reconstruct the objects, uh, like at a later date. Um, it had to be super high performance. It was distributed. Uh, so that means we were, we're going to have like replicated instances of this data store all connecting to a single, uh, Postgres backend. So like if RDS supported this, we, it would have been like RDS or something. <clears throat> uh, which RDS I don't think supports PG Notify. So, <clears throat> um, yeah, but so the, the ultimate thing was that we'd have, we have all these objects with like dynamic, uh, basically dynamic columns. And uh, we had to reconstruct them at like runtime. So that was the point of this, this problem. So what we did was we basically, I had to build a cache to store the name, like what I would use as column names when we reconstructed a, a table in a regular format. <clears throat> so, uh, what we what I used is I used Go because I'm super into Go, and I highly recommend it. And Postgres, something else I'm super into that I guess you all are too. And then the the library connecting them is the is Go's PQ library, which is the go to like the de facto uh, library for Postgres. <clears throat> so, um, this was a really complicated problem, but I'm going to dumb it down to just not dumb it down, but simplify it to two tables. So I have this fields table, which describes like all the columns that I have for my objects. So here I have like a UUID, uh, an, an object type ID, because you know, we can have different kinds of objects being described, the title of the field, so first name, last name, uh, and then a value type. So I, we turned everything into strings, and then um, 
when we would render it into a full object, it would, it would return back to its native format, its uh, native, native type. So this is like, you know, what, what the table looks like. So you have, we have a whole bunch of uh, UUIDs, and then the title, first name, last name, age, favorite ice cream, like whatever you want, and then value types. So zeros are strings, one are ints. And then here's the log table that actually uh, accepts the values of, for those fields. <clears throat> um, so we have uh, the foreign ID of a field ID, the value, and then like whenever this, um, this value was created, or this row was created. So this is what it looks like. There's you know, me, John Vianney, 27, favorite ice cream, vanilla. Fun fact, anyone who wants to get me ice cream. Uh, so basically what we do is um, the easiest thing to do is I cared about every time, uh, every time we, we created a new um, field, it would be a new column. So I wanted to cache that on the server side, like in the application, so I could really, really quickly construct queries uh, for reporting. So what we would do, so like, you know, what, what we do is we create a trigger on uh, new rows to the fields table. And in that trigger, we run this um, store procedure. And the store procedure, basically, I, we take the new row and I concatenate it into a comma-separated uh, comma separate, comma separated value. And then we call pg-notify on, on the new fields channel with the uh, new field payload. Uh, something else that you could do here, I thought, a little bit was over, I thought it was a little overkill, but you can use Postgres super awesome JSON capabilities, so you can uh, like JSON stringify the row and then just send this big JSON object. So that, that's another, that's a cool alternative, but it was a little bit uh, overkill for this. <clears throat> so now we're gonna jump out of Postgres and into Go. Uh, so in Go, this is how you would, uh, this is how you subscribe. <clears throat> so I have my, my driver object. Uh, so I connect to the Postgres, I connect to the Postgres uh, database. I have a report problem function, which is just like the error handler function. And then on line 26 there you see I, I create my listener object. So I um, basically I connect to, the po I connect to Postgres. Uh, I have a 10 second timeout. Um, call the, I have a rep the report problem callback. And then I subscribe using listener.listen to the new fields channel. <clears throat> and then I panic if something goes wrong. Uh, so um, you can use this. So what this does basically is this, this creates like a dedicated socket. So uh, I have my regular Postgres connection, which you use for, um, you know, to do regular queries and stuff. And then when you call a new listener, it creates a second socket dedicated just to listening. Um, so we have two, two connections with the Postgres client here, which makes... Uh, life a lot easier when it comes to that, that message queuing thing because there's no transactions running on the second session. So uh, the queue doesn't really fill up. <clears throat> um, so yeah, that's that. And then this is where we uh, asynchron asynchronously listen to that, uh, that second, you know, that, that exclusive socket to the listener. Uh, so basically I... Um, I have this infinite for loop where I block on, that so on listening to that socket. So while the socket is empty, this just does nothing. And as soon as uh, a, notifi a notification comes in, um, this case statement runs. I figure out uh, what channel was in the notification. Uh, and in this case, like all I care about is the new field channel. And then there I, I uh, take that payload string and I reconstruct it back into a, a field object for my application. Um, so this would be running like in a second, this would be, this is a worker, so this would be running in like a separate thread or a go routine or, you know, whatever. Uh, and then, you know, once I've constructed the object, then I add it to my cache. Uh, so like I said, you know, there, there's, there's, possi there's possible issues with, uh, you know, using this technique. Uh, the biggest one is that queue. Um, you know, that, that queue filling up is like a, is a really big deal because like unless you're monitoring the, uh, the logs, if that queue fills up, you're in really big trouble uh, because the whole, 
all notifications start to fail once that queue is, is in trouble. Um, another issue is timing. So since messages are only delivered between transactions, you know, so they, they only, they're only, uh, notifications are only sent when the notifier, uh, when the notifier's transaction is done, and they're only consumed when a listening transaction is done. Uh, if you have like a lot of long running transactions going or something, or you know, long running transactions going, um, uh, you can lose like this real time aspect because like the messages kind of wait for each other to be, they wait for each other to be ready. Uh, so that can cause a lot of confusion if you don't know that's, that that's how it works. Um, so in summary, <laughs> Postgres does this out of the box. Uh, you know, there's no need, so for, for the application I just showed or, or you know, for using a, an emailer or something, there's no need for like a secondary, another middleware between Postgres and whatever you're doing because Postgres supplies this, this publishing and subscribing, this asynchronous notifications uh, just right out of the box. Um, which is, it's really awesome and it's really simple, which is actually why this presentation is so short because Postgres makes it too easy. Uh, so uh, the only thing I can leave you with is watch out for really long transactions uh, and give this a shot because I think it's, it's a really cool functionality and it, it really opens up a lot of doors for a whole bunch of stuff. So I recommend it. If you want to talk about it, I'm all for it. Uh, once again, my name is John Biondi. I work for Double Verify. We are hiring and thank you for listening. So does anybody have any questions or questions, comments, concerns? So the, uh, the error log, you said it's automatically triggered at 50% capacity. Yeah. Is it configurable to do different ranges? So you could get a 25%, like, you know, something might be starting to go wrong, and a 75% now you can really start pushing out kind of thresholds? Uh, I, I don't think that's configurable. I know that the, the size of the queue, of the, the message queue is configurable. I don't know if that triggering is. I'm sure it is. I didn't do it because I figure if it's triggering at all, you have a problem. So I have to research it. Uh, you mean like the listen, that second listening socket? Yeah, yeah. No, it should it shouldn't because it just it should just uh, it should just like just stay open and then like the, you know the, it keeps alive on its own. So there, there shouldn't be any issues with it like timing out because there's just no notifications. As far as I know, I left mine running for like a week. Were you connected directly to the database or were you going through a load balancer or anything? Uh, the server connects directly to the database. Yeah, so there's no issues there. Uh, so that's something I'm really fuzzy on uh, because it looks like, so I looked at how the C library and PQ both deal with this and uh, it looks like you lose, me like let messages are just lost if you, if you especially if you disconnect too long, uh, messages are just dropped because like they're either cleaned out or like the session doesn't reconnect, it reconnects as a new session. So it, uh, yeah, I wouldn't count on, like, counting on the message delivery is not, like, super great. But it works really, I mean, it works really well. I didn't have any issues with, like, um, I didn't have any of those issues. I don't know. Man, you guys have a lot of weird stuff going on with your life. I mean, maybe I'm just super lucky with this. But I didn't have any of those issues. Like, I mean, when I ran it, it just, like, runs. <laughs> like...
For what? Uh, wait, so you mean for the whole like little program I just showed? Uh, so we just use it as like a, so it was for like a, it's kind of secret stuff, but basically it was just, it was just like a data store. So we were using it to just be able to dump, so from so different services would be able to dump their objects into this data store and we'd be able to reconstruct, oh, that's annoying. We'd be able to reconstruct objects like at snapshots in time or like, you know, across different domains. So it was just like a, It was just an object. It was just a data store, like an object store. What are the limitations of the data? Uh, it's just a text. It's just like a string. Um, probably. <laughs> uh, I don't. Know. I try to keep everything short and sweet because, like, when I was doing this, like, it had to be really fast. So, like, I mean, I only wanted like a couple characters. Just like basically, I wanted like UUIDs and then like maybe a title, just so for debugging. So like I never went like above like fifty characters. Uh, what happens if you have multiple subscribers and you and for the one copy you use just the one module for the copy and your product needs two subscribers? Wait, what? So you you publish through your uh, notify option, right? Mm -hmm. And then that's for the two two one copy, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Does it connect every notification to the group? Yes, it goes to all subscribers to a single channel. All running uh, uh, listeners. Yeah, anyone who's registered as a listener, they all get notified at roughly the same time. And if nobody's registered, then it can be just a single subscriber. Yeah, if nobody's listening, like it enters the queue and then it just is dropped and cleaned out because. The queue only holds the messages as long as there's listeners who haven't consumed it. So if there's no, listen li no listeners to consume it, it just falls right out of the queue. Wait, you mean like, so my Go background worker? No, uh, the, the internal Postgres background worker. No, haven't, you, haven't done that. Okay. I left all the, like the, concur like all the concurrent behavior, like I do that in Go, I just let Postgres figure out the rest. I think it's only on the master. I mean, I, I had issues with replication all the way around. So uh, I'm pretty sure it's only the master. I don't think so. I'm pretty sure it has to be a, uh, like a defined channel. That would make PG notify block? Yeah. Uh, I don't think so, because it run it doesn't actually do anything until after the transaction's been committed. Uh, okay. That's it? No, 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 okay. The actual, so the, the actual notification is run asynchronously, so it doesn't actually notify anyone until whatever transaction it was in is done. But if the transaction holds up, then the notify doesn't actually get sent. Anybody else? 
Cool. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, this is really fun.